haven't finished. No? There is huge public expense going to be tied up looking after these two people in a time when most ordinary people are having to bear real constraints, yeah. particularly in the public sector. Yeah. Okay. You sit in the second row from the back, and then I come to you. Yes. If they are a danger to the UK, they are also a danger to Pakistan. So surely they should be locked up and not deported. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Sorry. Um, the Deputy Prime Minister is quite right. We don't do torture, we don't send people to torture. That principle, by the way, is supposed to be a principle that binds all democratic people together and actually does bind the three political parties around this table together. It was Winston Churchill who spread that principle across post-war Europe. He had the distinction not just of standing up to Hitler, but of be being in his time both a Liberal MP and a Conservative one. Okay, but get to the one. point. What do you do in this case? And it was Caroline's party what's that your, gave us the human rights What's Act. your view in this case? Not only does Pakistan on torture people and that's why I share the Home Secretary's disappointment that they do that. It also is a place from which people who are dangerous terror suspects walk out of police stations and plot terrorist atrocities against other countries from Pakistan. So it is not safe in terms of human rights and it is not safe in terms of security. Until Pakistan ups its game, we're going to have to work harder to, to, to go back to old-fashioned charges, evidence and proof, and dangerous people can sit behind bars, yes, at public expense, but behind bars in Britain. But, uh, but, but, but the, yes. But they can't. Yeah, they, they can. Well, we're, we're told that they can't. The government can, says they can't. If we can't can I help have you with that? Well, I, I don't know. I don't know. Can Let I me try? Know. You know, you know, by the way, it's not an extradition case, Douglas. It's a, it's a deportation case. I think that a lot of the material in this particular case and many others um, comes from intercepted telephone calls and emails. And if, if that stuff can be seen in the Special Immigration Commission, it's time that we updated the law so that material can be put before 12 jurors right. at the Old Bailey well, so we can prosecute. Can, can, can <laughs> Um, well, I think this case raises a number of dilemmas, and I have to say I think it raises a huge dilemma for the Conservative Liberal Democrat coalition because the Liberal Democrats support the Human Rights Act, the Tories wanted to get rid of it. Uh, both parties, I have to say, have opposed control orders, which are likely to be the outcome of the case today. Now, would I like to be able to deport people, not just for terrorist activities, for criminal activities, uh, back to their country of origin? Yes, I would. But we are committed to the Human Rights Act, and for the reason Shami outlined, we have to take that seriously. But then we have a situation where we have information, some of it through uh, intercept evidence, as Shami pointed out, which does indicate, and clearly the court recognises, that these people are dangerous. They're a danger to our security. But actually, it is more difficult to then put that evidence in front of a court. When I was a Home Office Minister back in 2003, when I was dealing with issues around organised crime, I can assure you that if we could put that evidence into court without, without undermining the security of our intelligence services, I would be the first to do that. Now, we have had can a recent review... Can you just explain? Sorry, just no, said, can, can you explain important. why it we is? We have had a recent review led by Sir John Chilcott, mm. which has said that evidence should be admiss admissible mm. as long as it doesn't affect operational proceedings. That's where we have to go. Absolutely. But it, I hope we'd I all agree, agree that agree. it is very, very difficult. Of and in the meantime, is. in the meantime, Shami, we're going to have to have these control orders, and I hope... Absolutely. The Liberal Democrats and the Conservatives, now that they are in government and having to deal with national security, will recognise that when they were shouting at us about these things, that this is a decision mm. that they're going to have mm. to face up to. Theresa May, well, you're going to face up to that in the way yes, that it's I'm, put? Our position, and the position that actually we've come to in the coalition it's agreement, in the, is, in the document, is in fact the position that we had before the election, which is that we believe there should be a review of control orders. We also believe we want to, to look... We also want to look at the introduction of intercept evidence and at ways in which that can become permissible, Con commensurate with not uh, obviously revealing details. But we did going the review on that, didn't we, Theresa? Yes. So you only have to do is follow it up from what the Labour government started. Hopefully. <laughs> May I come back on that? <laughs> no, yeah. This isn't a party just, political this issue. Isn't, this is people's lives and their absolutely. liberties. Can yeah? I just make a point, though, about intercept evidence? Because I think we need to be absolutely clear that intercept evidence isn't the sort of silver bullet that is going to suddenly um, send all these difficult decisions away. It isn't the case that all cases will suddenly be able to be dealt with if intercept evidence is admissible. And I think we should... We should this is a, a, these are could, very could I answer on control no, orders? Hold on a second. No, I want to get to the man there. Can I just ask the panel, if we are 
worried about these two individuals, would it be fair to say then we should be worried about the 900,000 illegals that Theresa May apparently is now going to legalise on behalf of the Liberal Party? Um, I think you were not going to. I think that's a misunderstanding of the area. They, they dropped it, didn't they? The amnesty on illegal immigrants has been dropped. Given the, given, given dropped, given the scale illegal of two people. Illegal immigrants are not terrorists. Yeah. Forgive me. Douglas Murray. Douglas Murray, I just wanted to bring you... I'll bring you back to the point, which the other panellists all seem to disagree with you on, that the fact of what might happen to them if they return to Pakistan doesn't worry you or doesn't, wouldn't well, inhibit no. you from sending them no, there. Of course right? it worries me. Of course I'm not in favour of torture. Nobody's in favour of torture. However, we have to decide whose rights uh, should trump uh, uh, other people's. Do the rights of the British people trump the rights of al-Qaeda terrorists who come to this country and then claim rights they wouldn't afford to you and me? I'm not sure they do. We have a problem in this country. Firstly, because as, as Shami quite rightly says, Pakistan is an unstable state. Its prison uh, system is unstable. We'd have to have assurances they could be kept in prison. Rashid Ralph walked out of prison. Absolutely. Other people uh, have been kept in prison there. However, However, we, we have the following situation. Not only can we not deport to Pakistan, we can't deport uh, um, a famous al-Qaeda cleric who's still in this country to Jordan. We can't deport people. We, it took years to deport somebody to France in the 1990s. This is absurd. We have to make a decision about whether or not this country really wants to be the retirement home for yeah. all would-be jihadis. Man up there. Yes, you, sir. Uh, I, I, I think if we... Uh, don't protect the human rights of even our enemies, then we become a little bit more like them. Yeah, yeah. yeah all right. Just part, briefly, part, Ming, and then... Part of the problem me. is the fact that intercept evidence, it's not just people who happen to pick up a telephone and hear a telephone conversation. Uh, it's the product of some very, very sophisticated operational activity by the security services. And one of the anxieties is that if you use this evidence, then you have to source it. And those defending people who were charged on the basis of intercept evidence would have the right to explore that in cross-examination, perhaps in public. So that, you mean that the, the, the defence barrister would, have to, would be entitled to know where the information was Indeed. got, how it was no. got and all that? Yes. I think you can find safeguards to deal so with that I. problem. So do I. Uh, and Sir John Chilcott appeared to so think that these issues could be resolved. And that's why, as I've already said in this programme for government, intercept evidence is something okay. which I is going to be that. explored. I agree this is all difficult, but on control orders, could, could, could I just say, in honesty, that I have personally been accosted by someone on a control order wearing a plastic tag at large public gatherings that included ministers and former ministers. Um, being on a plastic tag in your living room is not where someone who's supposedly dangerous should be. We have to go back to basics. There won't be a risk-free society. Hang on. We can manage risk, but ultimately, we, we need to go back to charges, evidence, proof, and if you're guilty, yeah, of prison. Of course that's the case, Shami. We all want that. But, but the control means, orders do not Shami, make people safe. Shami, Shami, of course we'd like these people locked up if they've committed these terrible crimes. But the fact is, life isn't as simple as that. And Lord Carlisle, a Lib Dem peer, who's overseen this area for a number of years, recognises that in difficult circumstances, control orders are the best we've got. That's if we can find another services. way around it, All right, we're we're going to move way around it Thank we you both. We're so. going to move on to another question. Just defending old uh, We're policy. going to move on to another question, and if you wouldn't say to each other, hold on all the time, we might get through the material quicker. <laughs> <laughs> Narendra Ramnani, please. Clegg and Cameron seem happier with each other than either either do with their own parties. Uh, does the panel think that they have betrayed the core, uh, their core supporters? Clegg and Cameron happier with each other than they do seem with their own parties. Have they betrayed their core supporters? Caroline Flint, as an objective observer. <laughs> Well, they did appear very um, uh, together in the garden at, uh, at number 10 the other week. And I have to say, I mean, maybe, you know, they share so much in common in terms of their backgrounds that maybe that's part of the ease in which they work together. I think both of them uh, will have challenges in their own parties about uh, decisions that are being made and compromises. Clearly, um, you know, in this coalition document, there are some things that have been dropped on both sides. There are other matters that appear to be finding some sort of way of compromise or fudge, people might say, in other uh, areas. There are also other matters about their parliamentary parties and how they will respond. So, to be honest, 
Um, they're having uh, seemingly coming across together on the TV at the moment, but actually what will be the proof of it will be how it operates in Parliament over the weeks and